you know, if you're just trying to give advice out on social media to the masses, the advice was always eyes over the ball. But now the advice is turning into eyes inside the ball because that's where majority of light tour players and stuff are. But there's actually some people, a little outside the ball works for them. So it's all very down to the individual. This is The Tournament Code. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, Ross. We know a little bit about your putting background, being a putting coach, but before we get into that, let's start at the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about how'd you get into the game of golf? So my my dad's a good golfer and he's a greenkeeper. Uh, he's kind of retired now, but uh, just recently. So golf was always in the family. I started playing young. Uh, I got my first clubs when I was seven years old, but didn't play a lot until I was about 11 or 12. Probably about the age when we could start getting out in the golf course. I grew up in the highlands of Scotland where it's a bit quieter in terms of population. So we had access to a really good Lynx golf course that we could play quite freely. Um, so yeah, but probably about age 11, 12, started playing and really got the bug then and played a lot. That is cool. And so you started playing a lot. Then did you start playing tournaments? Tell us a little bit about what tournaments like. The structure is like over in Scotland, because I know it varies by where you live, at least in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I would say even though Scotland's a very small country, like where I grew up especially, is it's a lot more rural than what we call the Central Belt, which is I do live in the Central Belt now, but um, where I grew up. So, yeah, mainly just played my local area. So I would play all my, my home course stuff, and then we would go to like, junior what we call junior open tournaments just around the local courses they weren't like big national events or anything but they were the really good golf courses like i grew up 10 minutes from royal dorner so we would be playing like there and and other really good links courses around the north of scotland and you went on to play college golf tell us a little bit about like that path did you always know you wanted to play golf in college what or i guess university over there like what what got you to that so I guess it's it is a little different. It's not like I went to college to play golf. It's just I was I went to college, well what we call university. I went to one of the ones in Glasgow, Strathclyde University, and whilst there I was like, I'll better check out, you know, what the golf is like. Um and I got involved with the team and uh, played with them for four years. So it's it was really good and it was quite competitive. We played against other. We played in leagues against other Scottish universities. We occasionally qualified for the what they call the British universities knockout. So we would go down to England a couple of times and play teams down there. But it, you know, we just met up on a Wednesday afternoon at a driving range with a nine-hole course with our coach. That was just like one afternoon a week during the term times, and we would quite often have matches. Not every week, but on a Sunday, we didn't go and play. It was. I think it might be different now. It might be better now. It was getting bigger. It, you're just you're you're playing in bad weather all the time. It's full waterproof, woolly hat, pretty much all the time. Because you're you're at university from like October to May. It's like the worst time of the year. So that's probably why most people will go to the states um, to play golf if they can get in. But it, it was still good. It was it was it was good. I enjoyed. I really enjoyed my time there. And there were some good players, um, at you know Sterling University especially. Is I think even now there's still some really good players there. And I think it's even they've got a better standard than when I was there. It's nearly twenty years ago I was there. That makes sense. And at what point did you decide? You know, I want to get into golf coaching. I started doing my PGA training in the UK in 2009. I was age 29 by this point, so I'd been to college, and I just wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. But golf was always my main hobby, my passion, if you like. So I felt like I wanted a career in golf. And the PGA training appealed to me because it was it's not pigeonholing you to do something. I don't think I got into it because I wanted to be a coach, but not long after I started the training, it was definitely like, yeah, coaching's for me. Um, like most coaches, I knew I wasn't good enough to play for a living, 
and I never it never appealed to me. A lot of guys would do their PGA training with the goal of being head professional at a golf club, you know, where you run a shop and you probably coach a little bit, you custom fit. And some people love that variety, whereas I was like, you know, I didn't, I just wanted to be a coach. And then quite early into coaching, I realized I'd, I'd want to specialize in, into an area of coaching and that became putting. That is cool. So when you decided to focus on putting, what, what sort of things did you do to say, hey, like, not, not only do I want to do putting, but here are the things I'm going to study. Here's what I'm going to do to get more knowledgeable in this area. So the thing that I did was I spent a day with Phil Kenyon, who's you know, arguably the best known putting coach in the world. This was, it's almost exactly 10 years ago uh, to the day. It was in April of 2013. And he at the time would offer these courses. It was through the PGA because he's a PGA professional like myself. And he would, it, so it, was, it was offered as like a, course you could pay to go on and it would be like a one day with Phil Kenyon down at his studio in England where he's based out of um so I went on that core for one day in April so that's 10 years ago because I was confident it was something I wanted to do um that would be the area I would specialize in and yeah after that day I remember being like yeah definitely 100 percent it's it was putting that appealed to me getting to spend a day with him and at that time he was you know, you know, he'd be showing us like this is what I'm working on with Henrik Stenson and Martin Keimer and you know people like that. Um, back then, so yeah, now that was pretty cool, and that really exposed me to the, you know, that more in depth. And and I was like, wow, there's there's definitely a lot to learn. Uh, it's like you speak in a different language at times. Um, so yeah, that was good. That got me going. <laughs> so what was it? about putting in particular that drew you to it i think there's two two main things one i was looking around scotland thinking i don't really see anyone in scotland specializing in putting so that was part of it but i think is where you just kind of get attracted to what you're better at as well and i wouldn't say i was an amazing putter growing up but i was always a good putter it was never an area my game i had problems with whereas i always had like if i you know, look back at my own golf, why wasn't I better than I was? It would definitely be like ball striking, you know, especially with irons, you know, things like that. So it's like, you know, I feel I just felt I was more attracted to to coach something I was already a bit better at. <laughs> yeah, especially something maybe you might have had a intuition for or something of that nature. So you go start working with Phil or you go to you go to that seminar with Phil, you're like, okay, this is definitely what I want to do. This is what I want to help people on. What is what was the process like for getting clients? Because I met like golf swing. Everybody has a problem with their golf swing. It feels like you know, like I everybody can always get better at their golf swing. And I'm not saying everybody can't get better at putting. What I am saying is a lot of people are like, oh, like I just need to practice more. Uh, and putting lessons maybe aren't thought of in the same way that full swing lessons are thought of. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It was it was a slow process to get to the point where I was like, right, all I coach now is putting. So that's ten years ago I really got started. And I would say it was about still about four years ago I was still doing some swing lessons and maybe some junior coaching and I was starting to get to the point where I was putting no effort into getting better at that. And all my effort was going into putting, but I had no choice. To, to you know fill out my diary as much as possible I was working at a driving range at the time and they were great because they put in this nice indoor putting green they bought a sand putt lab as soon as I was getting interested in putting so I had the facility but yeah I was looking at my diary and going gosh I'm still I'm still doing the I'm still doing more swing coaching than putting coaching because as you say I don't I I just don't think many people go for putting lessons I mean I've had some you know, people say to me, you know, they come in for a putting lesson and they've said, you know, I told my friend I was going for a putting lesson and he, he laughed at me. I was like, what? He's like, he said, hey, you can't teach putting. You know, it's like, you know, putting's all about feel, isn't it? You don't, you don't go for a putting lesson. Uh, so you're kind of battling that mindset that might still be out there. 
So yeah, but I got I got there eventually. I got to the point where I could say, and I there were some junior golfers I'd been coaching since they were maybe like twelve years old, and they were getting quite good. And they're and I would say to the parents like, look, I'm not. I think they need a better coach than me for their swing because I'm not I'm not putting any effort into getting better at swing coaching. My focus is putting. Uh, I had quite a good little junior program running at the driving range. I gave that to a couple of other pros there. So it's like, you guys want to take this over? Because I felt like if I want the name for putting, I, I should be, you know, even though it might have meant my diary got a little bit quieter in the short term because I was like, but yeah, just trying to build that up. But but it's been good. It's, been, it's eventually it was worth it in the last three four years. You know, I I haven't done a swing lesson for a long time now, and I wouldn't even I wouldn't even attempt to. Do you still get asked questions by some people if you might be out golfing and you're like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a bit I'm a bit out of touch with that. But I'll stick to putting. <laughs> that that's awesome. So like, I got kind of a couple questions here. First off, do you have certain fundamentals in putting that you want to see in all of your students and second off what would you say like the most important aspect of putting is so overall so i would say yeah i think there is certain things i like to see there's certain just you know over the years of seeing people struggling and then you see the common problems by far the most common would be the movement of the part like the the way a lot of amateur golfers just accelerate the putter head through the ball. And a lot of that just dates back to old, you know, myths that hang around. And, you know, maybe it's even other golf. Like, we want our driver heads and our iron heads accelerating through the ball. And, and, and I think it's when most people come up short with putts, you know. And I don't mean coming up, like, an inch short and a long putt. I mean, like, coming up short to a problem that, you know, it's an issue. And they don't realize they're actually doing that while accelerating the part head. So the the logic is quite often that I'll, I'll probably need to, even if they don't think it in their head, they subconsciously will accelerate more because it's, you know, I'm, I'm short. So, yeah, I, I would say something I like. I like to see people generate speed in their backswing. I, I very rarely see slow backswings work well. But that's... A, you know it's difficult because some people listening might be like well, what what does that really mean is my backswing even slow and that's why i think you do need the coaching and the technology that measures these things and you can show people i think the most important is speed definitely i always if i if i get a new client though i first thing i try and do is get their setup in place because that just has so many knock-on effects but yeah in terms of putting i just say you know, if you're not going to do a lot of work on your putting, but you'll do a little bit, go work on speed because, you know, I, I see a lot of good golfers, like good amateur golfers that are making, you know, poor reads. They're aiming their putter poorly. They're pushing or pulling their putter, but they can all work together and a ball can still find its line okay. It's not the way I want them to putt. I'd rather they get the read right and the work down these biases on pushes and pulls and but at least you've got a fighting chance with those errors. You know, if you're if you can't judge the pace pretty well in a thirty foot putt, you're going to be three putting. You know, there's no way around that. If you're six feet short, you're six feet short. If you're blasting at eight feet by, whereas the other errors in putting pushes, pulls, misreads, you there's a way. They quite often are worked in a way that people are compensating to at least have a chance to putt okay. But speed, yeah, you got to get good at speed, I think. Right. So, like, you talked about not accelerating through the stroke. Does it matter to you whether or not the backstroke and the through stroke are the same distance? Or does that matter? I would say yes, but it's not something... I am um, set on as a coach. You have a preference. I just generally I'll show golfers what they're doing, and you're either going to be shorter in the backswing, longer in follow through. You're going to be pretty even, or you're going to be longer in the backswing, shorter in the follow through. Over the years, I've definitely built a preference for longer in the backswing, shorter in the follow through. But I don't, I don't force it on everybody. I generally like to see it even if at least and most golfers it's just about getting them to even have a little bit of intent i see some golfers even quite low handicaps where it's it's a mixture of those 
or it's quite even on say eight foot putts, ten foot putts, but you give them a thirty foot putt, the follow through starts getting longer because they're not generating any speed in the backswing, and that's the longer putts that will really show up. But I would definitely say my preference is longer back and a little bit shorter through. But that's usually just a byproduct. Like the long follow through is the byproduct of the acceleration. So if you can get them to, you know, get some speed in the backswing and you know, not slow it down in the transition. They're not likely to have a big long follow through anyway. Yeah. Perfect. Well, let let's say I'm listening to this and I'm like, you know, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure whether I'm ready to have a putting lesson. I I'm not I'm not fully convinced about this, but I do think what what you said right there about setup is is interesting. How does this person know that hey, my setup is messed is messed up, or what are some maybe some things that they can look at in their putting game be like oh like this might be a result of poor setup i would say like one of the best things an amateur golfer can do is just like get somebody to take a picture of their setup or look at it in a full length mirror and then go and look on the tv look at the pga tour players and there's quite often a huge difference now i'm not saying they've all got the same setup on the pga tour but there's there's nobody nowadays that doesn't have at least quite an athletic looking setup Whereas in the amateur game, there's a lot that don't. And if you look, it sounds a bit ageist, but if you go and look at a golf club and you go and look at some, say, senior amateur golfers that have never, you know, they just play golf for fun, that's totally fine, but they've never really cared. Like, there's where you're going to see the least athletic setups of you, like, you know, very, either very hunched over and the hands very close to the body, you know, just a setup that means you're pretty much going to be using your hands a lot bodies are all twisted and and things like that so yeah just it's it's worth looking at even just google you know some images of some of the tour players and you can see a lot of commonalities now of you know just good athletic postures it's really changed over the last few kind of year well i don't know 20 30 40 years probably even the 90s when i was growing up watching golf they were starting to get more athletic then like I didn't see a lot of golf myself of you know, like I didn't really see Jack Nicholas play or Sevy or guys like that really. I maybe saw little bits of the ends of their careers. You know, guys that didn't have these athletic looking setups. But the first people I would have played golf with would be like my dad and you know, and they did. So I think even people I'm forty three years old, even a lot of people my age will still have these setups that are very I don't know, old school or, and you know, some people can argue these guys patted well like that, but I just think the game's, the game's moved on a wee bit in that way. So a bit of athleticism, you know, like feel, if you feel athletic in your setup, you probably are. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's what I was just about to say is, you know, you see Jack Nicklaus and all those old guys just like super hunched over and they would just like have little pop strokes and now like, Obviously, you think of like Tiger and Rory, they're athletic and very smooth strokes. Do you think that's just because of how much faster the greens are? Or is there another the reason for that? I think the speed of greens have played a big part in that. Um, I think as well, just like coach. I mean, I don't even know what, who the first putting coach ever was. It maybe is like beyond the time when Jack Nicholas was even playing. Like, I don't really know what those guys did around their putting. I'd love to know how good their putt. Obviously, like Jack Nicholas putted great and won eighteen majors, but I'd love to know how good his putting actually was. You know, like from a strokes gained perspective or something like that. But yeah, they definitely didn't have as good quality greens and as quick greens. And you know, putters were lighter as well. You know, the, if you think about lighter putters and longer grass to putt through and. You can understand probably why there was more pop in the in the strokes then. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. I think one of the things that I've found in putting, and this could just be my personal thesis, but one thing that I think is overlooked in the putting process putting process is getting fit for a putter. And I can tell you that especially early, I, I've I've actually never been fit for a putter specifically 
uh, by by someone else. It actually took me to fit myself for a putter recently. Uh, for so we'll see we'll see how good that's been. Uh, it's it's improved mm-hmm. my game for sure. But what I've what I've found uh, in doing that is like I always felt like everything you bought off the rack, you know, it's thirty three, thirty four, thirty five inches, and it's mm-hmm. approximately what are they? I think eighty degrees. Um, is no, it's 70, 70, you're right. 70 mindset, mm-hmm. mine 79 or 78 or something like that, which is why it's so funky. But for someone like me, who's six, three, and, uh, I don't know relatively how long my arms are to my torso, all that kind of stuff. But as far as like getting into a putting stance for me, I actually reverse engineered it. And I said, okay, like, as opposed to like building my stance around how this putter is going to sit, I'm first going to stand mm-hmm. up. I'm going to see like, all right approximately where am I going to feel the most comfortable putting to make an athletic mm-hmm. motion? And then I built my putter backwards around that. So I added a little bit of length, knocked it to like 77 degrees, 77 degrees. Uh, so it's pretty upright. And then that's well, upright. yeah, I had, had, uh, I've had some significant improvement, especially on the speed end, but Good. through that, mm-hmm. through that process, I realized and noticed like, man, like imagine going to the store and like, buying something off the rack like there's a reason maybe there's a lot of unathletic looking putting yeah. strokes and mm-hmm. it's because people are buying putters that mm-hmm. uh don't fit necessarily their body shape body type natural motor patterns so they're having to build their putting strokes around those putters what have you noticed in fitting people for putters helping people find putters that are right for them etc yeah, I, I could rant about this all day. That I think it is bad, and putter fitting is so far behind the rest of the game. Everybody gets fit for their irons now, and their wedges, and their hybrids, and their when you speak to fitters, it's really you know getting more advanced very quickly all the time. And there's even just this year, I'm noticing specialist fitting places opening up here in the UK, and and it's uh, but putter fitting still miles behind. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one, there's less money in putters. They're they're not as expensive as a set of iron, so you're not going to make as much money. So that might put some people off and down. But I think, for me, I think the main reason that I don't think you can separate a putter fitting from putter coaching. Personally, I don't like to do that. If you just think of like we talk about things like toe hang, and you know somebody needs a face balance putter, a toe hang, you know that bit of extra weight in the toe of a putter. Typical amateur golfer can override that toe hang quite easily. If you just think of the torques you can apply to a putter with your hands, and that's what a lot of golfers are doing. So I quite often, if somebody books in for a fitting with me, I'll even talk them out of the fitting to to begin with because I'll say, look, even if we do like one lesson and you go away for like a month, you will be in a much better shape to get a really good putter fitting. But there is a situation where somebody's come in and they're six foot five and their putter's 34 inches. I'm like, right, okay, we do just need to get you out of that putter. <laughs> or you can occasionally get somebody whose putter's 30 years old and it's got six degrees of loft on it or something like that. But yeah, in the main, I'm like, look, your putter's fairly modern. It might not be the perfect length for you, but the, there's bigger areas you can improve your putting in and it's like, you know, get your set up sorted. But even if I just sort of do a bit of, well, I call it like a lesson fit and it's like a bit of coaching to get the set up right. It's definitely nowhere near the rest of the game. I don't know as well whether manufacturers, the major manufacturers, if you think about it, if they just build thousands and thousands of putters at three different lengths, as you say, 33, 34, 35, everyone gets the 70 degree lie angle. Most of the big brands use about three degrees of loft. It's perfect for them. They just put them in all the shops around the world. People go in, buy them, you know, roll a couple of putts on a mat or something, buy them, and they just rinse, repeat, do that over and over. Because I get people turning up for lessons with like six putters under their arm, saying, "Hopefully, you can tell me which one of these is best for me as well." Because I just keep buying putters. So it's it's going to be more work and less profit for the big brands to do it the way I think it should be done. And that's why I use a brand uh, called Seymour, an American brand, and they do it differently. I don't claim their putters are better than anyone else's putters in terms of quality. I don't think there's any difference between any of the top brands. I think all the, I used to custom fit for big brands at my old place of work. 
And I, I realised pretty quickly, do you know what? Pings, Odyssey, they're all Scotty Cameron. They're all very good. But Seymour allow me to fit properly. The putters get built to order. And they're a putter specific brand. So it's it's perfect. I get a lot of tall people coming. And some of them have been playing golf for two, three decades with a putter too short for them. Uh, I've had some real, I've had six foot seven guys in. They not only can I get a putter built for them properly, it'll be weighted properly. You know, because you could, you could technically buy a 35 inch putter and plug it, but yeah, this will be weighted properly and everything. And so yeah, I enjoy putter fitting because I poaching was what I always wanted to do, but I realized pretty quickly I I'll keep fitting as well because it would frustrate me to be coaching people like especially someone I was working with over the long term, and they just didn't you know they just couldn't get a putter right because they were very tall or not very tall. I mean, even myself, I'm not particularly tall, but I use a 33 and a half inch putter. And I've used 33, I've used 34 in the past. But now that I've used 33 and a half for a long time, if you give me a 34, it feels horrible. So I'm, I'm in between. And so, and I do loads of fittings that are 34 and a half. And so, yeah, just, just saying that the whole golfing world should either be a 33, a 34, a 35 to me is crazy. That makes sense. Is there like a quick, reference to like how tall your putter should be so like if i was just standing on the putting green and my putter came up to my belt buckle for instance you know where should that putter come so up to you can measure your i usually measure measure knuckle to floor and i've got a little chart it was a chart that's actually made by seymour i have it up in my putting lab and um it's like if your knuckle to floor is like 31 inch you're probably going to be about a 34 inch putter but there's other variables like some people just putt better with a bit more forward bend a bit less forward bend also one golfer might be an eyes over the ball putter and have the same body shape and posture as another guy that's maybe two inches inside the line he might need a little bit longer putter some people measure wrist to floor and the wrist to floor is quite often very close to the putter measurement. But yeah, it's it, these are just guides. It's a good starting point. I'll measure knuckle to floor, right? Looks like you're 35. But the way the fitting goes, it's very rare they're going to be miles out of that, though. They're either going to be 34 and a half, 35, or 35 and a half, probably. But yeah, not, rest, that makes rest sense. to floor would be the one that's seen as closest to the actual putter length. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up the eye position in the putting setup because when we were, me and Daniel growing up, I mean, everybody had the eye line mirror and everybody was taught, you know, you need to have your eyes over the ball. And so we just kind of came to think that that was what we needed to do. But through practicing over the years, I was like, you know, I don't really care about this. Like, whatever mm -hmm. feels comfortable, whatever I can see my line, I'm just going to do that. And so how would you coach players on where their eyes need to be? So I, I do a test with a mirror and then I will use a laser. I'll get a straight putt of about 10 feet and I'll place a pen, like a biro pen that will be maybe around about two thirds, three quarters of the way into the putt. And that the laser will shoot through the middle of the mirror, middle of the pen to the middle of the hole. And then basically get people to, first of all, take their normal posture and say, right, where are your eyes? And then just say, like, avert your eyes along the ground to the pen. And how does the pen look? And if the pen looks straight, that's good. I'll keep your eyes where they are. But yeah, I would say the majority of people are better inside the ball. But some are over. I, I personally, I pat with my eyes over the ball. I, I even have a couple of players that are actually outside of the line of the ball. And nobody, nobody anywhere is going to tell like, people to do that. As in, like, you know, if you're just trying to give advice out on social media to the masses, the advice was always eyes over the ball. But now the advice is turning into eyes inside the ball because that's where majority of like tour players and stuff are. But there's actually some people, a little outside the ball works for them. So it's all very down to the individual. Makes sense. So I guess I want to just kind of talk about what I've been going through with putting for the past couple of years. So like when I was in college, 
I was a pretty solid putter. But when I would get down, you know, maybe the last final nine holes of the tournament and I was like near the lead or about to contend in a tournament, I would really struggle inside like five feet. My hands would shake. No control over the putter face. I was putting with a two line San Diego. So it's like a basically like a Scotty Cameron Newport. And so I would putt like pretty solid throughout the tournament to get myself in that position. And then once I had a three footer, I would just like get super, you know, mm-hmm. I'd be nervous, but I would be nervous like on every other shot and be able to pull yeah. those off. But I just have no controller face. And I, would, I had the yips when it came down to it. Like I'm not like going to say I didn't have it because mm-hmm. I did. And so I didn't really have any way to fix it. There's some, like, I tried a lot of things. You know, I tried the pencil grip. It kind of calmed my hands down a little bit. But when the arm lock stuff came out, I was like, you know what? This seems like it's actually going to work. And so I got one of those wrist lock grips, extended putter, extended my putter, and I put it arm lock. And, like, honestly, like, that fixed my yips. Like, I didn't struggle inside five feet like I was anymore. Good. So what would be your process in trying to help a player who has the yips, let's say? So I worked with a few people with the yips, but less than I thought I would have. I worry that a lot of people with yips just think they're beyond help, so they don't they don't go for help. Obviously, a serious competitive golfer like yourself would, but I, you know, I've seen some golfers that just just put up with it and accept they're going to be like a a ninety ninety five shooter when they really could be like an eighty shooter or something like that. I always think there's a bit of debate with yips. As in, like, co- if you're a coach like me, you quite often see the issue as being more technical. And if you're more into the kind of neuroscience, that kind of area, they would see it more as being in the in the head. And in reality, it's probably, <laughs> it could be a bit of both. But I would always, first of all, want to look at the person's technique because you know, one of the best explanations, I think, for these things are that maybe there's been a lot of compensations in the past. So, you know, say somebody aims a putter where they think they're aiming it and they don't have a big push or pull bias. They've got quite a smooth flow of their stroke. That still takes a level of hand-eye coordination like any sport. And then you get another golfer who, you know, maybe has acceleration in the stroke or, you know, actually doesn't realize he's aiming way right and pulling everything. That maybe requires extra hand-eye coordination and that takes its toll down the line, which might explain why, obviously, you had problems quite young. But a lot of people maybe pat okay for 20, 30 years, and then, not saying they part great, but they part okay, then it starts creeping in. And I think that's quite often because the the technical wasn't as good as they thought. They just worked out how to get the ball in the hole, and it just starts taking its toll. So I would definitely want to know a lot about the stroke when I'm testing them, you know, in my putting lab type thing on my capsule system. There's not a huge amount of pressure. But you can sometimes see that look, there's nothing crazy going on with your hands here or anything. But some people there is, and that is, that's hard to figure out. And that's where I think pencil grips, ball grips, arm lock putters have, have helped a lot of people. But I'll quite often try and do things around quieting their mind. I, I think the best thing, though, for, and I would just say whether someone's got the yips or not, anyone that struggles in tournaments is like, how do you approach a putt? I think it was Brad Fax and I heard first talk about this, where he just says, like, just treat a putt as a putt. It doesn't matter the situation. It's either a 10-foot putt, 20 foot putt. It's not a par putt. It's not a birdie putt. It's not a must-make putt. It's not a difficult putt. It's not a hard, you know, it's just, it's just a problem to solve. Make your read, you know, work out how far you need to hit it get a feel and, and you know, kind of execute. And, and I try and treat putting, my own putting like that, and I try and encourage people to do that. It's easy to say, though. It's not easy to do. But if you can, nothing happens quick, like overnight as well. You can't just, all right, that's what I'm going to do. I'll just go and play golf like that, and I'll be great. But if you just start thinking like that now, 
then maybe it will just gradually get better, which is kind of, which is great. And then in, within a couple of years, maybe you, you get to a point where, yeah, you just, you just see a putt as a putt, you know, whether it's the first hole of the, you know, first round of a tournament or the last hole, you know, try not to think of things as, oh, I, I have to make this putt, you know, I need this putt. You're just adding baggage to it. So, yeah. But there's a lot of ways you could go with yips with people and just sometimes it's about experimentation, you know, but trying to quieten the mind and trying to, try and, uh, you know, experiment with grips is usually quite good. I mean, that, I mean, that mindset's not only good for putting, but it's just a really good mindset to have like on, in yeah. golf in general, just to look at every shot as a uh, golf shot, you know, and I'm trying to do the best thing i can with mm-hmm. this shot yeah try and control what you actually have control over and that's what i say to people exactly. with putting as well you know there is there's an element you know if you have a really hot round with a putter there's a lot of luck involved in that but i would argue the better putters For are sure. going to have more hot rounds but yeah don't you know just because your your 15 footers are not going in and your your 10 foot and you can get frustrated you miss you know, three ten footers in a row or something like that. But like they're not easy putts. And you can do everything right and, you know, a gust of wind can come, the blemish on the green. So just trying to say don't try and force it. Like know what is a good putt for your your standard of golfer as well, you know. I think it's so easy to hit a you know, hit a really good it's not easy to hit a good drive, but you can hit a good drive, you can hit a great iron shot into fifteen, twenty feet, miss the putt and think, oh that was a that was a good birdie chance, but actually wasn't, you know, when you look at the percentages that holding a 15-foot putt and a 20-foot putt at tour level are. But you feel, I think you can feel you deserve it because the drive was right out the middle and it was on the middle of the fairway and you hit this beautiful six iron, you know, into 15 feet. It, it almost feels like you've done the hardest part. But actually, no, you've, you've still got a putt that's like only you know, one in four chance of holding if you're a tour pro or something like that, you know? So yeah, just, just try and relax, not force it. Pat, except you're going to put bad as well, you know? Absolutely. I think that's one of those things where strokes gain putting is very helpful. And then yeah. even, even beyond strokes gain putting is understanding what a hard putt is and what isn't a hard putt because it can, I think strokes gained is probably, I think the best measurement we have as far as like, quality of play in an area but even as Mm -hmm. mark brody says and others it's not necessarily perfect because it can't account for like at least when amateurs are using it it can't account for specific difficulties of a course or specific specific difficulties of a green like a 20 footer at Mm -hmm. cooper's home course is the same diff same strokes gained as a 20 footer at my home Mm -hmm. course on and it could it it could look a whole lot whole lot different so that expectation management plays a large part in like knowing that like i can tell you i played yesterday i had a 30 footer this is going to sound terrible at a 30 maybe 35 footer and i rolled this putt and i left and it ended up with seven feet left which sounds really bad uh you should not if if you have a flat 35 footer you should not be left with seven feet but it was it was one of those putts that had to go up over a ridge and then the pin was on like a 3% slope. And so maybe two and a half. And so if you missed it, like I had a buddy who rolled it up to three feet and then it rolled away to six feet. That's just kind of how the cookie crumbles. So understanding that yeah. managing those expectations mm-hmm. and being able to gauge, even when you have strokes game, being able to say, Hey, this one, this one's a little bit different and noting that down that way you don't beat yourself up. Cause that when mm-hmm. we talked about with the yips, I don't know how scientific this is, but I, th- I think there's basis for it from the, with the people that we've talked with. And I think yips are both mental and mechanical, and it's a cyclical system where something goes wrong in one end or the other. So either mentally you're concerned about something or physically concerned about something. Then you react to it, and then when you react to it, we don't react in the best of ways. We usually react in horror ways, and so then by reacting to it in that manner like so we're like all right let's just let's just put it let's get it over with and it makes it makes it worse so you start feeding the you start adding in bad mechanics with 
bad mentality. And I won't, I won't go through that rabbit hole. I've been rambling a little bit here. I wanted to talk a little bit mm-hmm. about arm lock. I, that's how, that's how I found my putter that, that more upright one. I was putting with a conventional Scotty X five really liked it. But after a while I was like, okay, I'm just going to try something new. And I went down the rabbit hole of learning about zero torque putters. I don't know how familiar you are with like messing around with those, but it was interesting. And so I ended up getting one of those lab putters. And while I was at it, I was like, okay, you know, I might as well try out this arm lock thing. So I got it super upright and I found, Hey, like this works pretty well. And it, and just like Cooper found Cooper's was like a baby arm lock. It came up maybe to mm-hmm. like just above his wrist here. It was, it was very like inside, inside five feet, inside 10 feet. I felt very good about making putts and getting good rolls and my strokes gain putting showed it. However, speed control, especially on when you play on like tour level greens on normal courses, it was fine. Once you got on tour level greens, it was much harder to get the right speed down. What, how do you consult your students? Like, have you ever put anybody in an arm lock putter? Are you super against them? I mean, I'm interested to hear kind of the methodology about why you might put someone in or if you just never would do it. I haven't, but it's, it's pretty much because I only fit for one brand, Seymour. They don't they do not do arm lock. They don't have an arm lock option. Um, I don't think there's that many in Scotland yet. These are the type of things that are pro- we might be just a few years behind you guys on. So I do think they probably will appear more. They are available. Like I do think um, there is brands that offer arm lock. I'm sure Odyssey did one, and I saw one once. I look. Yeah. I am of the opinion with pine. Whatever works, I don't care. So if somebody comes to me for a lesson, I'm not going to change things based on my preferences. Just arm lock helps you. You should definitely use it. But I just don't think there's as many in circulation here yet. I could be wrong about that. There may be more than I think, and I just haven't seen that many. I haven't personally played a lot of golf the last eight nine years um and i've just more you live in your bubble where you're coaching and Mm -hmm. so there maybe is more of them out there than i realized but i just i haven't seen a lot yeah and and that would be the one thing with arm lock that i would say is when you're if you do not buy arm lock off off the rack because it's it's worth it's worse than just buying a regular putter off the rack because arm lock needs to be kind of specifically crafted around yeah. like uh-huh. how you're how you're standing etc because if you get it wrong like if you, if you get it wrong it's not gonna it's not gonna produce a positive effect i think i think i think they're good i was just interested cooper i know you had something to say too yeah i was just i was just gonna say i know like I'm, I'm i've never played over there but i know the greens are generally yeah. slower over there compared yeah. to the u.s and i would say that probably having such fast greens over here is a reason that people are going to arm lock and yeah, we you know. don't get those real scary parts. That, like whenever I face them, it's probably when I played in America. Like I think I've not played loads of golf in America, but I have a few times. And yeah, I, I think the fastest greens I've ever played on have been in America. Yeah, when I think about it, like we just don't. Our best courses in Scotland, most of them that can afford the budget to produce amazing quality greens, are links courses. Most of them, not all. So there's too much wind to you know have them running at 12 on the stump or 13 stump. So yeah, we just don't face those greens very often. It was su- it was surprising to me when they were playing the last year of the British Open at St Andrews. I think they said the greens were running like 10 or 11, and I was like, 10 or 11 at a major? Because you know if they play at Oakmont like for the U.S. Open, they're at 15, and wow. it's just. Yeah. It's. I mean, I remember the 2015 Open at St Andrews, though it, it, there was a, a delay. It finished on, when Zach Johnson won it, it finished on the Monday because of wind on the Saturday, I think. They lost a day or most of a day because of wind, and that was with 10, 11 stimp greens. So if, they, if they'd have been, I mean, last year was okay, the weather was good. But yeah, if you get that wind, which you can get even in the height of our summer sometimes, the links courses you just get you'll get too many days where the it's unplayable if the greens were that quick i understand well i have a, I have a few more questions we don't want to we don't want to use up too much of your time but i did have something 
that I wanted to talk about. We've talked a little bit about putting mechanics. We've talked a little bit about putter fitting. We've talked about a lot of the basics that come to putting, but early on in the podcast, you said the most important thing, if there's one thing you had someone work on, it would be putting speed. If you, if you didn't see anything, if they just had a little bit of time, hey, work on your speed. I want to talk a little bit about putting practice. As a coach, I'm sure you prescribe putting practice to your mm-hmm. students. What does, if you say, hey, student, like you need to go out and do some putting practice, what are some drills that you're giving them? And how much time per week are you recommending your student spend on putting practice generally? So what I usually do for time spent is I ask players to to commit to a time. And it all comes down to, you know, the what time, what level of player are they? What level do they want to be? You know, if you're if you're like a, a junior player with a lot of time in your hands and you say you want to go to college in America or, you know, eventually be a tour player, it's like, well, you, you're going to need to put in the hours um, that other people. So, I, I, I mean, my, I have a sort of six-month program with people that I do. And part of that program is I ask for a commitment of what, you know, right, what are you prepared to practice and what have you got time to do? And I, I think for... A lot of people, I don't, you know, if, if somebody's an amateur golfer with quite a good handicap, but they've got a family and a full time job, you know, so even if you can only do 45 minutes a week, 30 minutes a week, it's far more about the quality of practice than the time. And if somebody's just saying, right, I want, I want to get better at golf, I'm a, you know, single hand, digit handicap, or whatever, I don't expect them to go and just practice their putting and ignore the rest of their game either. You know, I do think, you know, your ball striking will be, you know, probably the biggest factor in the level of golf you get to play at. But I would just be worried if you ignore your putting, what can happen, you know? So it's like, I just try and get people to commit. So if they say, look, I've only got 30 minutes a week to write, that's fine. Let's make it a really good 30 minutes. Um, And the practice will generally be tailored to them in terms of his technical, but you know, my most, like, once I get their setup in place, I'll say, right, well, this needs maintenance. Like, you you can't just get your setup and say, right, well, my setup's good now. You need to check it. So it's like, you know, I, I use putting mirrors all the time, something to check ball position and, and eye position. and So check your setup regularly. And that's something you don't need to spend long doing. In fact, one of the probably worst things you could do is spend an hour on a putting mirror. Like, I just don't, you know think that would translate you know you, you can't take your mirror around the golf course with you so just spend five minutes on it regularly and then you know if you've got something technical to work on you need to devote but i wouldn't advise doing a lot of that unless you're working with a coach because you could just practice in the wrong thing and then it's like more your performance practice so get some speed drills there's there's just so many out there i you know i've got a couple of good sort of ones i go to anything that gets people just focused on the putt and it's like it matters and you're not just like rolling the same ball to the same target uh, Mm -hmm. over and over you know you're you're changing it and then just you know just i usually try and get people to on their distance putts try and get them to get the ball within 10 percent of your initial distance that would be a good benchmark so you know if you're practicing a 30 footer Get it within three feet. That's a good part. I don't care if it's short, left, right, or long. So, I mean, anyone can Google putting drill, or the speed drills, and, and there'll be loads out there and, and try a few. And then when you get, when you get some. I also run a, I run a putting group where I, I put drills on that and then I try and, try and add to them. Try and give people a few options and then just whatever your favorites are. But don't just do the same one over and over. Try and have, you don't need a you don't need a catalogue of twenty either, you know. Three or four good drills that you go to. And then practice holding putts. Generally inside ten feet, maybe with a little bit of ten to fifteen feet. I don't see the point in trying to practice holding thirty footers that much, you know, because nobody nobody's ever been able to get good at that. So I don't think you can. <laughs> um so yeah, practice mainly inside ten feet. I do a lot of three and four foot practice that kind of four or five foot drill, like ladder drills and round the hole drills and things like that. Try and add a bit of consequence to it. 
you know, um, try and replicate a bit of pressure. Quick question. Whenever you have a player do that ladder drill, do you have them go through their routine on every single putt or does it matter? I try and I really try and enforce that with junior golfers especially because I know I wouldn't have done it as a junior, but I didn't have anyone telling me to do it. Do you know what I mean? Like I, if your practice looks very different to your, you know, on the course, like we care about the putts on the course. You know, even when you're playing a practice round, you know, just care about the putt because that's what you're going to do in a tournament. So, yeah, uh, try and go through your routine. Um, and j- your routine doesn't need to be overly complicated. Try and keep it short and efficient. But, yeah, these days a lot of people use a line on the ball when they putt, which I don't think everybody should, but it helps some people. And if it helps you and you use it and you like it, that one of the biggest mistakes I see is people, they don't use it on the practice screen. I quite usually when I get a player and for a lesson, it's um, one of the first, ask them a few questions, do a little bit of an interview. And then while I'm putting their name into the kind of my capital system to start collecting data, I give them some golf balls to putt with. And it's very rare do they use the line when I'm, when they're warming up. And then it comes to, right, now we're going to do some, the test I go through. And I say, oh, do you use a line on the ball? And loads of them say yes. And I'm like, well, I've just watched you putting for five minutes and you didn't use the line once. And, you know, so it's things like that, I think. And but yeah, as you say, go through the routine. Definitely. That's perfect. I think that what you've given us today gives a lot of context to our listeners as far as how to how to improve their putting if they aren't going to go to a coach. But obviously, I think you're predicate you lean this way and I think we lean this way too. If you're going to work on putting, it's a good thing to work on with a coach, a good defi- good thing find a knowledgeable coach before we get to our last question i wanted to ask one other question which is okay this whoever's listening to this maybe they should go to a putting coach what should they be looking for in a putting coach i would probably say someone who specializes in putting would be if you can and there's definitely more people doing it all the time i think uh, i just think that's the way the industry's going it's like there's more people focused on the fitness side there's more people focused on you know short game and things like that whereas years ago probably a lot of coaches just tried to do it all i would try and find someone who specializes because i get a lot of lessons where people come in and i say i always ask have you ever had a putting lesson and most people haven't or they say oh yeah i've got a i've got a swing coach i've worked with for years and every now and again we'll go on the putting green for 10 minutes 15 minutes and sounds bad but quite often they've been told something that's hurt their putting you know, because it'll just be something very like, like casual, and and it'll be just like, oh look, you're you're aiming left, but that aim that left aim might be for a reason, you know, and just just that information isn't really good. Or a common one, I mean, like a lot of people get told to, oh, you get the ball further up in your stance to hit up on it or something like that, and that cause that can cause all sorts of problems. So yeah, try and find someone who that that's all they do. It's like anything; the more you do something, the better you get at it. So. If somebody's all their focus is on putting, then they're probably going to get better at it than someone who just does, you know, one putting lesson a month because they do mainly swing lessons. So if you can find someone who specializes in putting, I think that's the best thing to do. And it's it's easier now than ever as well because of online coaching. So even if you don't have a putting coach in your area, you should be able to find an online putting coach. Absolutely, I know. Tell tell us quickly. What kind of players do you generally work with? Do you work with people online? All that kind of stuff. I I have a really wide variety. I say, because I've had people phone me that are maybe like an 18 handicap and say, oh, would you work with a player of my level? And I'm like, definitely. Uh, I work with anyone who wants to improve. But yeah, I've got, I've got tour players on my books. I've got, you know, People that are quite new to golf on my books, a few junior players that are pretty good. Yeah, and I probably would say the most popular client I get is like a low handicap amateur, somewhere in the region of like a a five handicap to like a plus, you know, plus two, plus three, that type of. They would be the most common, but I I love it when you get twenty two handicap in because it's like, you know, they're quite often they've come to see you because they're like. 
three putting eight times a round. And it's not that difficult to improve from that. You know? Um so I yeah, I quite enjoy working. I just I quite like enjoying working with players of all levels and ages. I've got you know, players as you know, junior players and I've got senior players, um males, females. So yeah. And online I've I did I kind of resisted online coaching uh for a while. I I saw a lot of good putting coaches doing it and advertising it and I was a bit like because I love, you know, I've, I used Stamp at Lab for about five years and then the last four years or so I've been using Capto. So I've always used something that really gives you data that the naked eye can't even see, let alone a, a video. So I kind of resisted it. And then it's more just this winter. I thought, do you know what, I'm going to, you know, you can get left behind. I thought if everybody's doing it and that that's the way the industry's maybe going as well. So I embraced it more this winter and I've, I've actually really enjoyed it and I've seen some things about it that it can be quite convenient for people. And I think the more, again, the more you do it, your eye gets better. Like I'm starting to watch videos now and notice things I wasn't maybe noticing as well six months ago. So I've, I've, I quite enjoy the online coaching now, actually. Interesting. I think I, li- I lied about us getting to our last question because I have one more question before we get to our no last problem. question. And you mentioned that you work with tour players what is what are some of the things that you've learned working with tour players a couple of things that surprised me was actually the the issues are similar it's not drastically different you know quite often would be you know somebody's struggling it will be like a bias around you know look look how far left you're aiming they didn't know they were doing it and then you're hitting push patch yeah you're probably better at compensating for that than a 12 handicap but yeah a lot of the issues are similar and sometimes it is that you know around acceleration and and things like that but sometimes it can be easier as well because it's like they you know they're going to go and practice it so you get they they'll get results they'll get the results you need quite quite quickly but yeah it's 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 good i don't think i would like to just only work with tour players though like some people do i think i i like that you know the differences very cool well perfect we appreciate you taking the time to join us the last question we ask every guest is the same and for you since you also teach people it'll be a two-parter so first if you could go back to yourself as a junior golfer what is one thing you would tell yourself and similarly if you could only tell a junior golfer one thing what would that one thing be oh i there's a thousand things i would tell myself but if it was one I think I would have tried to be around people that, you know, know how it works, like as in getting better. And, and like, I think where I, where I grew up, especially at my home club, didn't actually have a golf coach when I was growing up. So I didn't get lessons. I, I was uncoached, really. Like, my dad was a low single digit without any lessons, still has never had a lesson. And my brother is a good player. We didn't take many lessons going up and it's not even just about getting the technical coaching, but like get coaching from people who have experience and they know, you know, they know what needs done. I I wish I was around that more. So not just to have had a technically better golf swing, but just to be like, right, well, I would go to the practice area and chip some balls and there'd be no structure to it or anything like that. You know, learn how to practice and be around the people that know that stuff. And then one thing I would tell a junior, I think in this day and age, the main thing I would say to junior, if you've really got ambitions, like even if you're only ambition right now, like try and get to college in America or, and then try and, nah, you're going to have to be really good. Like, and it's only getting better. It's the standards getting better. Cause I see some juniors with some talent and ability and they're just kind of coasting along, you know, like they're keen. They like, playing golf and they practice but it's like i don't know i think if you can get you get insights sometimes you ever listen to podcast interviews with you know whether it's a rory mcelroy or justin thomas like the more you can hear these guys talk and the way they go about things and it's like try and find you know do something similar because i see a lot of kids that are good and talented but they're nowhere near that committed and dedicated and yeah I think it's only going to get harder and harder to get on tour as well. I I believe it. It takes a lot. We got buddies out there, and it takes 
it can take it can take a long time and a whole lot more work than people think. I think that's that's a perfect wrap up there. Tell us where people can find you on social media, reach out to you, they want to work with you remotely, all that kind of stuff. So I am on um Instagram, Facebook as Ross McLeod Putting. I'm most active on Twitter at Ross McLeod Putt. And it's McLeod is L M A C L E O D. Um I, I have a website, Ross McLeod Putting.com as well. Twitter's where I'm most active. Um but I do have a presence on the others as well. But yeah, any questions, just send me a message on any of those platforms i will i will get back to you my website kind of details the kind of stuff i do face to face and and online and yeah i also run a a putting group on the coach now app which people can subscribe to it's very affordable you can subscribe for six or 12 months and you know it's just packed full of drills i improve it all i'm always adding stuff to that group so that would be the best place perfect be sure to give Ross a follow. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please subscribe and leave us a rating. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. This helps us get our message out to more people. And if you're trying to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram at The Tournament Code and on Twitter at Tournament Code. As always, we appreciate you joining us and we look forward to diving in deeper to what it takes to play elite tournament golf. 